Good evening, and welcome to the Editor's Roundtable and the fifth week of the Clarion West Virtual Summer Reading Series, hosted in partnership with the Seattle Public Library and University Bookstore. My name is Rashida Smith. I am the six-week administrator for the six-week workshop at Clarion West. Before we begin this event, I would like to acknowledge that Clarion West is organized in Seattle, the traditional unceded territories, territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This event is supported by the Clarion West Writers Workshop, the Seattle Public Library Foundation, author series sponsor Gary Kunis, media sponsor, the Seattle Times, Amazon Literary Partners, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, King County for Culture, and the many individual donors that support our programs. Thank you. Our ASL interpreters tonight are Laurie Reinhardt and Emily Thiel. Our mission is to support emerging and underrepresented voices by providing writers with world-class instruction to empower their creation of wild and amazing worlds. Through conversation and public engagement, we bring those voices to an ever-expanding community. For the first time in our history, that community is entirely online. Please enjoy the roundtable and stay after for a moderated Q&A. We will take questions from anyone watching, so you can enter them directly in the chat box next to or below your YouTube screen. Please welcome tonight's moderator, a Seattle Public Librarian and Clarion West board member, Misha Stone. Thank you, Rashida. And um, as Rashida mentioned, uh, we know that you're going to have a lot of questions for, you, for us and for the editors. Um, don't wait. Feel free to put them in the chat. We're going to have a series of questions that we'll be asking first, but we'll be compiling our questions and asking them when we open um, the Q&A. So my name is Misha Stone, she, her. I'm a reader services librarian at the Seattle Public Library, and I am so pleased to be um, moderating this Editor's Roundtable event. Week five with the, um, the editors who come to the workshop is always a highly anticipated week, and the fact that we have four amazing editors with us tonight is just, um, just fantastic. Thank you so much. So I'm going to introduce them. Uh, Scott H. Andrews writes, teaches college chemistry, and is editor-in-chief and publisher uh, of the six-time Hugo Award finalist online fantasy ma magazine, Beneath Ceaseless Skies. Scott is a graduate of the Odyssey Writing Workshop, his literary short fiction has won a thousand dollar prize from the Briarcliff Review, and his genre short fiction has appeared in Space and Time, Cross Genres, and Anne Vandermeer's Weird Tales. Scott has lectured on scores of convention panels at multiple world cons, world fantasy conventions, and regional conventions. He is the six time finalist for the World Fantasy Award, and he celebrates International Stout Day several times a week. More in quarantine, we'll find out. Next, Thank let me introduce. <laughs> right. Next, let me introduce Chinelo Anwalu, is a Nigerian writer and editor living in Toronto. She's nonfiction editor of An Anathema magazine and co-founder of Amanana, a magazine of African speculative fiction. Her writing has been featured in several anthologies and magazines, including Slate, Uncanny, and Strange Horizons. Check out her new story in Uncanny this week. She's been nominated for the British. Science Fiction Awards, the NOMO Award for African Speculative Fiction, and the Short Story Day Africa Award, and is also a Clarion West alum. Julia Rios is a queer Latinx writer, editor, podcaster, and narrator whose fiction, nonfiction, and poetry have appeared in Latin American Today, Lightspeed, and Goblin Fruit, among other places. Their editing work has won multiple awards, including the Hugo Award. Julia is a co-host of This Is Why We're Like This, a podcast about how the movies we watch in childhood shape our lives for better or worse. They've narrated stories for Escape Pod, Podcastle, Pseudopod, and Cast of Wonders. And Wendy N. Wagner is the managing senior editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare magazines and is the incoming editor-in-chief of Nightmare in 2021. Her SF eco-thriller, An Oath of Dogs, was a Locust bestseller. Her other work includes two novels for the Pathfinder Tales series and more than 40 short stories. 
She also served as the nonfiction editor of Women Destroy Science Fiction, which was named one of NPR's best books of 2014, and the guest editor-in-chief of Queers Destroy Horror. She lives in Oregon with her understanding family. Please welcome all of our editors. Um, to get us started, um, I'd like to have each of you, um, perhaps just for the, the beginning in order of how you were, you know, of your introduction, um, what you do, how you got into this work, um, what it's like to be an editor. Scott? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, so, uh, Beneath Ceaseless Skies uh, is a, a bit of a niche magazine. We publish fantasy that's set in secondary world settings, otherworldly settings, or historical settings. So I got into that because it was what I wanted to write and what I wanted to read. Uh, and this was about 15 years ago. Uh, and at that time, there was no dedicated home for that type of story written with a focus on the characters. Uh, the, there was a, a lot of fantasy set in interesting worlds, but for my taste, it was more focused on the plot or adventure. Um, and I like a line from uh, William Faulkner's Nobel Prize speech, where he says, the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. So I wanted that, but set in worlds that don't exist. Uh, and I had some past editorial experience from a college literary magazine, uh, and I, I, I thought the field could use a, a home for this type of story. It was what I wanted to read. And I knew some great literary fantasy writers who had grown up reading secondary world fantasy um, and playing role playing games. And I figured that if there was a home for that type of fiction, those writers who had that kind of vibe in their background, but maybe weren't writing that sort of stuff at the time, uh, would be interested in writing it. Um, and that readers would be interested in, in reading it. Uh, and I'm very gratified that 12 years later, that has turned out to be the case. Thank you, Scott. Chinello. Um, Well, for me, editing, it, it was a bit of a convoluted journey. Um, I started out as a, uh, I'd been writing my whole life, but um, when I went into journalism um, in grad school, I realized very, very quickly that reporting was not for me. Uh, talking to people was just not really my thing. Um, but what I was actually really good at was, um, was editing what came in. And so um, I very quickly graduated and transitioned from um, like a reporting role to an editing role. Um, and um, I found myself when I moved back to Nigeria in uh, 2009, that there was a huge market there for someone who could edit. Um, we, we had a lot of writers, a lot of people who were trying to figure out what their voices were, uh, but we didn't have a lot of people who could sort of guide them and who could um, tell, let them know, you know, what was working and what wasn't. So um, I quickly found a niche in in terms of freelancing in Nigeria and um, editing there. And so uh, that's actually where, when, um, when, my, when my partner, um, uh, Mazi, decided to put together Omenana, um, I was one of the first people he called because I was one of the few people who was kind of doing that work um, on the ground. And um, I'd already been publishing, you know, um, speculative stories here and there. and the we figured that what we needed was someone to help curate the voice um african speculative fiction has been emerging for 15 a uh, 10 10 15 years now um and each time it's it's rediscovered and it's re it's you know it's recurated like you know oh, who are the people doing this we don't know um but the truth is there are quite a number of people who are actually writing african speculative fiction they just didn't have a place where they could directly go and get published and they didn't have someone who could help help them align with what was being looked for in terms of the market what what could be marketable um what versus what they like to write so there is a difference, and um, I think what got me into speculative editing was basically there was a niche, and I ended up filling it. 
in some in some real ways. Um, I'm not sure there it's there's still a lot more writers on the continent than there are necessarily editors, and that's something that we're still developing. And um, part of what happened when um, a, a bunch of us got together to create the African Speculative Fiction Society about two or three years ago was that we recognized that there was still a need for someone to be able to go in and smooth out people's work, help give people the um, the direction that sometimes is lacking and not and not there. Because when and I've seen this in my own um, writing when we give our writing out to people who are outside of our cultural context, we, we lose something really important. Um, we end up having to do things like explain things that would in context be completely understandable and normal. We end up having to put things in our native language in italics to show people that, oh, this is a foreign word, be careful. Um, we end up having to provide a kind of handholding that isn't provided to us when people in the mainstream and dominant you know writing community write nobody ever stops to nobody when i was reading growing up nobody ever stopped to explain to me what winter was they just assumed i knew what it was i'd never seen snow i don't know what the fuck that was but you know somebody's like sledding down a hill and i'm like okay i'm rolling with this but when i talk about you know eating um uh, roasted plantain. I have an editor writing to me and saying, you need to explain what plantain is. And I'm like, do I really? So I think there's still a need um, in our, you know, neck of the woods for more editorial work um, in terms of speculative fiction. And it's nice to be in that position, but it's a, a little exhausting because I feel like we still need more people, we still need more editorial voices. Um, and so it's nice, but yeah, I'm hoping that you know, when we have this panel and roundtable next time, I won't be necessarily the person speaking on this. There might be other people who are. So, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you, Janello. I also love that you and Scott created spaces that had not previously existed. It's one of the, the beautiful things that you can do um, out there in the world is create those spaces for the writers and see the need for more editors. Julia. Yeah, so I started editing originally. My very first editing was my high school newspaper. I was the editor in chief of that. Um, but then I took a very long break and I didn't start editing fiction until 2012 when I joined the team at Strange Horizons. And I owe an enormous debt to Jed Hartman and Karen Meisner and Susan Marie Gropey, who were the original three editors that all left their jobs and then replaced themselves with other more diverse editors. And most of us were newer and had not had the experience that we were learning from the ground up. And one of the things that Strange Horizons does, it, it's possibly the oldest science fiction and fantasy magazine online uh, that's been continuously publishing stories since I think the year 2000. They've always really cared about bringing new voices in. And so there was a focus on taking stories that might not get accepted at other places because other editors might say they weren't quite ready yet. But if we loved them doing extensive work with the authors. Um, so I kind of learned, that's how I learned editing, is I learned to work extensively with authors on a story that I loved that wasn't quite ready yet and helping them get it to, to the place where it was ready. And because of that, I think what Chinelo is talking about speaks very deeply to me. And that has carried over into all the editing I've done since then. And I've edited for several magazines and anthologies and various places. And every time I'm always looking to see how much we can include and what does it mean to expand the boundaries of what is new, what is different, who is emerging, what does emerging mean, and what does inclusivity mean? So I think that's really important to me, and I, I love I love Chinelo's answer, and I agree, and I never italicize something if a character is speaking their native language. Thank you, Julia. 
uh, Daniel Hesse Older has a, an, an incredible YouTube video about that very topic, if, if anyone missed it. Wendy. Uh, I guess it kind of all started when I was in college, I started working as a writing tutor and, um, and I, I really liked the work and I, I, very early on, I kind of became like a specialist in helping uh, students on campus who were there in the English as a second language program. Um, and then, you know, years went by, I did stuff, finally started getting back into writing and things like that. And uh, around the time I sold, had my, my first professional writing sale, which was uh, to an anthology that John Joseph Adams edited called The Way of the Wizard. Um, it was 2010, late 2010, early 2011. And that's just about the time that uh, Lightspeed started and John needed some extra help uh, with editorial assistance for anthologies and things like that. And I started working with him just kind of um, more as a favor to a friend than anything else, because, you know, editing sounded like completely wild, really hard work. You're just like reading slush till your eyes explode. It sounded really grueling and not like any fun at all. And yet somehow in like 2011, I found myself working as the assistant editor of Fantasy Magazine, working with JJA and, you know, just reading slush and, and loving it and I don't know even how that happened. Um, and then in 2014, um, I, I left Fantasy when it got rolled into Lightspeed and they had plenty of staff. They, they didn't really need me. Uh, but then in like 2014, John was like, I am really busy. Can you come help me out with Lightspeed and Nightmare? I need somebody to be a managing editor. I need somebody to help me work with authors and things like um, rewrite requests and to help with line editing in the magazine. And little by little, I've just sort of stepped up my duties there. You know, I've been running the nonfiction at those magazines for kind of a while now. And for me, I think one of the greatest things about being an editor is that you're in this, and I think that like Julia Scott and Chanello like brought this up. You're in this wonderful position to like create community, right? Like that is what our job is. We're like, it's not just picking out stories and throwing them out there on the wall and seeing if they'll stick. It is about like encouraging writers. It's about seeing our community just like grow and blossom and trying to encourage like, you know, more stories. And, um, and it was so great working on the destroy series when we hosted that at Lightspeed. you know, we, we, there was women destroy and they did that in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, there was queers destroy and there were people of color. And then we handed off the torch and uncanny just did the, the disability issues. And I think it's just been a really great way to kind of, bring more attention to the fact that there was for a very long time um, many people who completely dominated conversation of what science fiction and fantasy meant. And because of that, a lot of people got shut out and they felt like there was no place for them. And I'm just really excited to see more and more, more and more markets coming up that are saying, no, science fiction, fantasy, horror, this stuff is for everybody. And I think it's a great time to be working in the field. Thank you, all of you. Um, I want whoever wants to jump in first to, to answer this. And it's, it's, it's really kind of continuing that, that piece that Wendy just shared, which is um, how have you seen the field change in the last five to 10 years and where do you think it needs to go? I can jump in on that. So one thing that I have seen happening a lot in the last five to 10 years that I love is that I'm seeing more black authors being spotlighted. And that's for a variety of reasons, including the black spec fic report that was coming out for a few years that Fireside was running and also Fire Lit Magazine and the work of people like Chinelo who are working hard to bring Nigerian authors and, and help them sort of figure out how to navigate the field, there are more people doing that work. And I'm seeing 
uh, more doors opening and it's a slow process. It's not a perfect process, but I am seeing more of it and it's very exciting to me. Um, I got to edit a story called The Secret Lives of the Nine Negro Teeth of George Washington by P. Jelly Clark, which won some awards and was a really wonderful, amazing story that I think is the kind of story I wouldn't have seen when I first started working in the field. So it's very exciting to me to see that. And I am seeing things like the People Destroy series paving the way for more inclusivity on lots of different axes. And I, I think we can stand to see a lot more and I'm excited for it. Thank you, Julia. Who would like to jump in next? Um, I, yeah, yeah, I think um, uh, on that, uh, thank you, Julia, for those lovely, but, uh, but I will echo that in, in a way is that I'm seeing um, more voices coming up um, and less, when, when the call for more inclusivity uh, came out, what we saw was more white people writing in people of color into their work um, and not, not, not as many, um, you know, own voices uh, out there. Um, I will speak from the perspective of um, African speculative fiction and say that the landscape today is hundred times um, just just exploded um, than it was maybe let's say ten years ago or five years ago. Um, the fact that people who first, you know, tentatively sent in their stories um, to Menana now have books out. The fact that um, there are, you know, when I first started, I think uh, Nidhi Okarafo was probably the biggest name um, for like an African person writing speculative fiction from an African point of view. And now there are just too many to count, right? I mean, who would have thought that, you know, Tomi Adeyemi was going to get like, what, I think a six figure book deal? I mean, that's insane. Um, that being said, uh, I think that there is still, you know, and the fact that somewhere like Anathema, we are, where we're doing people of queer people of color exclusively did not exist. But, what, but that being said, we are still seeing a lot of spaces that are still excruciatingly teeth achingly white and those spaces still feel that um it still feels like there isn't they're entrenchingly white they they're they're, they're not moving and they're, they refuse to move in some ways um and in some ways the the fact that there are more people of color black people africans writing speculative fiction and in this field has given them call these spaces cause to say, well, everything's fine now, right? Look at all these people. Um, you know, we don't need to change. And I think that's particularly um, those conversations are having are particularly difficult in the Canadian sphere, where um, in some ways the structure is still very much entrenched, and people are more willing to not seem racist than not be racist, uh, if that makes any sense. And so um, when you have a publishing structure, the publishing structure, which is which undergirds um, all of what we do, still being in the hands of a very few, uh, a very certain type of people, you know, um, it's still heavily male, it's still heavily white, um, at least at the very top. Um, and even though there, 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 there's movement, and especially the last few, you know, months with the Black Lives Matter movement coming back again. Um, it does feel like we've made progress, and yet we're still exactly where we used to be. So, I would say, um, I would say that I, I can only have hope, and, and hope that the next five years, this question doesn't even come up because, you know. Things have changed so amazingly. But fingers crossed, right? Thank you, Chinello. Scott or Wendy, would you like to jump in? 
I feel like it's easy to want to play like chicken, like you go, no, you, you, you. I mean, on top of like major important currents like inclusivity, um, you know, you just see a lot of trends come and, and go over the years. I think when I first set out uh, really submitting short fiction, that would be like 2009 was when I was like, I will start to be serious about short fiction. I started sending things out and, you know, there were like five magazines that were like, we love Slipstream, give me that. And like, now does anybody say Slipstream? Is that even a word we use anymore, right? Like, um, I, and like last year, I feel like there were probably like five new uh, magazines that were like, we only want literary science fiction. Like it, it needs to be absolutely literary. And, you know, and all of those sort of magazines, I feel like there are always really trendy things that happen in our genre. And somebody maybe inherited some money or they had a really big tax return that year and they get to start their dream magazine. And that lasts until the money runs out. And then there's a new hot topic and somebody else did okay on the stock market or something. So it's always ever changing. And it's just a delight to see what will be cool next year and what will be forgotten. And um, I just, you know, I do think like, let's not let inclusivity be slipstream, okay? Like, don't forget it, people, because that needs to be, like, real and in our hearts. Thank you, Wendy. Scott? Uh, I would say that I love the fact that in, in the last five or ten years, I've seen a lot more what I would call indie online magazines uh, 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 enter the field, uh, niche magazines with, with a specific, um, ethos, maybe artistically, or maybe, uh, uh, an inclusivity, uh, uh, a paradigm behind them or social issues. Uh, environmental justice is one, a theme I've seen about several magazines. Um, so I'm very happy. I think some of that may have to do with on uh, the rise of online fundraising opportunities for such magazines, but the fact that small independent magazines that might be more niche than could have survived 10 years ago are able to, uh, to operate, to publish, to draw like-minded, uh, writers and editors and, um, people interested in working for them, uh, to them, and thereby to promote not only art and our field, uh, but also their niche uh, uh, mission or purpose or, or reach, whether it's a, a focus of inclusivity or a focus of a, a social issue or even just a particular uh, artistic focus. Uh, because to me, then, the, the panoply of those indie magazines plus whatever was in the field before that gives uh, writers and readers a really wide variety of things to access uh, that will be hopefully entertaining to them, but also interesting and stimulating and, and a positive influence on them and the field, uh, draw in more writers, draw in more editors, and keep the field snowballing and growing and spreading even larger in directions that I think are very important for it. Thank you all. In the case of all four of you, you are also writers as well as editors. I'm very curious to hear about how you manage those different creative energies. Whoever would like to start. Or is it easier for me to pick? Julia. <laughs> Oh no, I feel like my face is too expressive. So I get called on. Um, I, I think that I am a slow writer and I, for a long time, had a hard time sort of sitting at peace with that. And I came in the last couple of years to really understand and accept it in a way that I think with the editing work for many years, just kind of, I didn't write at all, mostly during the time that I was editing. And now I realize that I've unlocked some ways that my personal process works. And one of those ways is that I, I have to tell myself about what I'm going to write and then just sort of let it simmer in the back of my brain for a while and do other things. And then I'll come back to it. And sometimes I'll get something that comes out in, you know, a three hour burst. 
And I think anyone looking from the outside would think that this is the kind of thing where it's like, well, you know, they don't write very often, but when they do, they just sit down and then there's a story. And it's like, no, actually what happened was a year ago, I told myself, I want to write a story about X. And then a year later, I had the three hour time when I, my brain said, okay, you know what? It's done. You can do it. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of my process is just sort of in the back of my brain while I'm going about the rest of my life, sort of taking the time to compost everything into a fertile story ground. And I think with editing, especially, it can be very difficult because you are always not just consuming other people's words. And I think that most writers consume other people's words and that's great. That's a really good way to keep your creative juices flowing but you're engaging with them in a creative way and you're helping polish, you're helping create, you're thinking analytically and critically in ways that you also think when you are writing. And that can be a distraction. And it can also be something where you can worry that those things are influencing you too much. You can worry that someone else's work is actually in danger of slipping into yours in some way, whether that would be the worst case scenario, plagiarism, or the the best case scenario, like you end up taking on amazing stylistic techniques that you hadn't thought of before, but they weren't ones that were yours to begin with. So it can kind of take a while for me, especially to just sort of sit with those things when I've seen and, and engaged with them and learn how to incorporate them my own way. So I think, yes, for me, it's a slow process and I'm okay with that. And I know other people for whom they can just kind of compartmentalize and switch and be very prolific. And I think for every single person, it's different. Thank you, Julia. Wendy? Well, I wouldn't say that I am prolific by any means, no. Uh, <laughs> But I do a good job of compartmentalizing, and that is that I sort of keep to a really regular schedule. Um, in the morning, I try to do some writing work, uh, whether or not it ever turns out to be any good, you never know. And then in the afternoon, I try to do my editorial work. Um, and that's something I've kind of just worked out over the years as being a great way to kind of balance the workload. I feel like my brain works extremely differently in the afternoon than it does in the morning. It's just a good time for me to be a lot more organized, analytical, and um, and and to be more chatty, like to return all those emails. Because one thing they don't tell you when you set out as an email as a as an email, as an editor, is that 80% of the job is just somehow email, email, all the time, email. Um, yeah, so that's that's my answer. It's, uh, it's bright in the morning and edit in the afternoon. <laughs> Pretty boring. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Chinello. Um, unfortunately, I have not figured it out. <laughs> I wish I had. I have, I'm still figuring it out. Um, writing and editing come from the same part of my brain. Um, and so when I'm writing, I can't necessarily switch out to edit and when I'm editing, same. So what, um, what I found is that I need to give myself periods of time when I primarily write and periods when I primarily edit which was one of the reasons why I ended up stepping down from my post as the editor of Amenena. And I, I'm still there as a, a co-founder. So, you know, um, big decisions. I'm looped in on some of the bigger stuff. But day-to-day um, but -day editing, I don't do anymore. Um, I am the nonfiction editor for uh, Anathema because I find that fiction editing and nonfiction editing are a little bit different for me. Um, I can do nonfiction and, you know, journalistic editing in a much more analytical sort of step back uh, process than, than with creative editing, which does actually feel like a collaboration almost with the author. Um, and so for me, uh, in order to sort of preserve this, the, this, the well from which my stories come, 
I can't necessarily be dipping into it to do creative editing. So um, those are things I have to be very, very careful about. So the last, I'd say maybe year or so, I have been trying to focus more on my writing. And like Julia, I'm a very, very slow writer. So um, uh, something that's just been published, uh, I think this year was written in 2014 and refined over, you know, the space of like four or five years. Um, an idea that I wrote uh, about maybe six years ago was finally turned into a short story that I that was able to be published um, with a uh, Slate magazine last year. And so, so in order to give myself the space to write, I do need to step back a bit from editing uh, because I do find that it is an intensively creative um, procedure. And, I, you know, I, I would love to, to do what Wendy does and just, you know, have mornings and afternoons because that just sounds like the dream. Um, but unfortunately, I had a kid. So now I'm going to have to renegotiate all of that again. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Chanelo. Scott? I actually haven't written fiction in a in a number of years, and uh, part of the reason is I'm I I was nowhere near on the level as a writer of our uh, other panelists here, but part of it was also a time thing, and part of it was not being able to figure out how for me to balance the the mental aspects of editing with the writing. I mean, similar to some of the things Julia said for me. Um, even before I was an editor and before I had started BCS, when I was writing, I was I was often unable to turn off the internal editor, um, as uh, writers often uh, call it. Um, and it was partly also a time thing. Um, I have other artistic pursuits. I'm a musician, and in recent years, I've done a lot of amateur uh, uh, game writing. Um, so that sort of mindset is still very much a part of my life. Um, just not fiction writing. And I'm very curious to see, you know, whenever down the road, uh, BCS wraps up its run, who knows when that'll be, but I'm very curious to see if writing calls to me again uh, at that point. Thank you, Scott. So we have a couple of questions from our cohort, um, and then we're gonna take a little intermission. Rashida will come back and then we'll answer some of the questions we've been getting from the audience. I wish we had like the whole night. <laughs> We have so many great questions, but this is from the cohort and I'm going to let Scott start this. Um, when you're looking at stories to buy, how much are you weighing things I personally like versus things I think that the audience of the magazine likes versus things that have the potential to go viral versus things that have the potential to win awards? For me, it's probably the first two. It's things I like and things I think the readership will like. And I think I have a... I'm lucky to to be in a selfish sort of position with that in that BCS, the the ethos is to to be things I like that fit that niche. It's really my editorial vision. And that's why I'm so grateful that writers and readers have been interested in my editorial vision because I didn't know if they would or not. I didn't know if anyone would care that what I thought was interesting. So I think I'm lucky in that those first two things overlap. Um, and so that's what I do. If something if something moves me or engages me, uh, I put it out there. Um, and sometimes the the readership likes it. Sometimes when I take a bit of a risk, uh, every two years we publish some science fantasy special issues that are still fantastical but are futuristic, um, like with spaceships, uh, instead of being pre modern technology. And some readers love those, and some readers didn't. Um, I liked them. I was delighted to to have put them out. Um, as far as viral, I'm not sure I understand what goes viral, so I, I could really. Uh, likewise, I don't think I understand what wins awards. Uh, so no, those last two are not on my radar uh, at all. But hopefully, what I like, the readership will like, and that's what I try to put out there. Uh, Wendy. Yeah, I, I gotta say, like, you cannot predict what's gonna win an award. Those award givers are fickle, fickle people. They just, they like what they like. Sometimes they like people they know. Sometimes they like people they don't know. You just 
you can't count on them. So just ignore those people. I think it's not even worth thinking about them. Just try to find the stories that, you know, you care about. Try to find the stories that you feel like you have to get out there in the world. Um, I think that's all that counts is just doing that and the rest will take care of itself or you'll go out of business one with two. Janello. I will, I will 100% agree. Um, I, when, when choosing stories, even, um, even here in Anathema, I, I do have a bit of a say in what goes in and what doesn't. Um, it's 100% what I like, 100% what's moved me. What I look for in a story is that sense of, huh, at the end. Um, and I don't know that there is a scientific um, explanation for that. I don't know there's a, if there's a breakdown for that. Um, it's, it's more of a sense of when I've read the story, do I feel moved? And that's it. Um, I've never tried to limit myself to, you know, genre, to, um, uh, to audience. I, maybe I should be more mindful of my audience, but I, I, I never have. Um, one of the things I always try to do when I was at Amenana was find ways to push the conversation forward. Um, and so uh, in Nigeria, it, we have on the books um, some very homophobic laws. And, um, and I, one of the things I've always wanted to do was to push the conversation around uh, queer identity, specifically on the African continent on, and in Nigeria particularly. And so, and, and uh, this is something I love Nazi for, is that we were always looking for the lookout uh, for stories that told queer stories, um, if the writer was comfortable enough to like to publish them. And being at Anathema, it's something that we, we're still doing. And so um, I, I always try to ask myself, what is it that, what, not only do I like it, but will it get people talking? Will it get people, um, will it move people? Will it introduce them to new ideas, to new voices? Um, and that's really it, that, that, that's it. Virality, awards, I mean, I can't even tell you that in my own writing, much less anyone else's. So, you know, um, I, do, I do go in with a little bit of caution in that, I do try to keep up with what's being um, discussed online, even though I'm not necessarily a big voice. Um, I'm not necessarily one of the people making the most noise, but I am doing a lot of listening. And so I think it's super important that editors not be insulated from the, the currents of what's actually happening in the world. Um, that's where you get situations where you know, a, polit a potentially inflammatory title is allowed to go ahead and spark this huge conversation around, you know, trans identity, mostly because the editor involved was not aware of what was happening and so kind of basically stepped in it. And so I think part of what it means to be an editor, at least in my corner of the world, is to see what's happening, understand what the currents are, and then try to position yourself in a way that moves things forward, not backwards or, or not act as a bulwark. Um, and, and that can be a delicate balance. But is it a calculated one? I don't think it's possible to really, it's more of an art than a science. Yeah. Thank you, Chinello. Julia. Well, I want to agree with everyone that you can't know what's going to go viral and you can't know what's going to win a, it will, an award. And often something that goes viral will win an award because that means that a lot of people know it. Um, there's no way to predict that though. For every story out there that wins awards, and most of those stories are really good, there are also a ton of other really good stories that for some reason nobody noticed really. And they got published and the editors loved them and they're amazing and the writers are amazing, but for whatever reason, they didn't go viral. So as an editor, 
all I can do is get really excited about all the stories that I've published and be like, Hey everybody, look, I've brought you some things that I really love. I hope you love some of them so that we can talk about how great they are together because that makes me excited. I'm always happy, so much more happy to promote work that I've helped edit than work that I've personally created. That feels so much more comfortable to me. And it's because I genuinely love every piece that I've chosen. But that said, I do sometimes turn down pieces that I like for various reasons. And I've done it in every place that I've worked for. Sometimes for a magazine, one of the things that I've often said is, you know, you can love something, but if you've already bought two mermaid stories and your magazine is not called Mermaids Monthly, then suddenly you're going to be the mermaid magazine if you buy a third one. And no matter how good it is, you might just have to turn it down. But on the other hand, if you're working for a themed call, if, I, if I'm working for the Cast of Wonders Band Books Week, which I guest edited last year, I have to make sure that what I'm choosing has a YA sensibility and band books as the sort of heart of the story. So I have to work within those themes. And there may be something that comes in that I think is really good, but it doesn't quite fit the theme as well as other things do. And even if it's a delightful story, it's not necessarily going to be accepted. So I think that's where thinking about the audience of the magazine and thinking about what they're expecting. If I'm reading for Nightmare, I'm not going to choose a happy fairy tale that doesn't have any gruesome bits. <laughs> I'm going to go looking for the Bluebeard story. <laughs> so, so I think that those are the things to keep in mind is everything is its own personality. Every venue that I've ever worked for, whether it's an anthology or a magazine, it has a personality. And when you learn what that personality is, the, the magazine itself is sort of a living entity and what fits in it will kind of come to you. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't love everything that you choose because generally I don't know any editors who aren't excited about stories, but it does mean that you'll start to automatically filter the kinds of ones that you love for this particular instance. And I would think that even Chinello says that she has not done that, but I bet she has because she already has things like, oh, Anathema is only searching for queer POC. <laughs> so that's already a filter that you're sort of looking and applying. And I think that those are the ways that I apply things to. I think I grew up making mixed tapes and mixed CDs after tapes stopped being a thing. So that tells you something about my age. <laughs> um, but all of those were about curating selections of songs and deciding how they played with each other and how they are in dialogue with each other. If you're going to buy two mermaid stories, are you going to put them back to back? And if you are, what are they saying about mermaids? Thank you, Julia. I have one last question before we take a little intermission and then go to the many, many questions that have come in. I think we're going to spend a little more time than we anticipated because they love you. Uh, Julia, why don't you start us off with this question, which is, what is the work or, or you know, the author and work that you are most proud of working on and with? Oh, oh no, this is so horrible. I, so I have to confess that Misha sent us these questions ahead of time. So we knew that we were going to be quizzed on this. And I agonized over this one because it's impossible to choose. Uh, it's really, it's really, really hard. I think one thing that comes to mind as a wonderful time in my editing history was getting Amal Omotar to give me the story, the truth about owls for kaleidoscope in 2014, because she didn't want to give it to me. <laughs> she didn't, she didn't think that she could write the story and do it justice. And it was just sort of months of saying, no, I know, I know, I know you can give me this story and it's going to be great. And when she finally did give it to me, it was basically perfect, but just the satisfaction of actually being like, ha, I was right. I knew it. You had the perfect story in you <laughs> was a really good time. Um, so that I think is one of them, but honestly, every single author I've ever worked with has, it's been an honor and, so many brilliant, amazing stories. It's so impossible to choose favorites. 
Thank you, Julia. Scott. I I agree that it's it's really impossible to to choose favorites uh, among seven hundred children uh, for me. Um, I do think one that that has a, a a treasured place in my memory partly because it's a situation that has uh, expanded and grown uh would be working with rb lemberg and their stories that are set in a fantasy universe called birdverse um and they sent me the first one uh we published it in 2011 so i think they sent it to me in 2010 um incredibly lush rich fantasy world if you're not familiar with it uh thoroughly thoroughly developed from the very start uh with very complex social structures um that uh also are extremely thought provoking uh and unusual from our real world uh western cultures in their gender relationships and gender family structures um and uh this fantasy world like uh, real worlds contains different cultures within it and their interactions um, as well. Um, and uh, we worked on that first story to uh, hone some some things about it. Um, and then uh, a year or two later, I've got the web page in front of me. I think it was 2015 uh, when uh, we published uh, Grandmother Nylalet's Cloth of Winds, another story in that world that went on to be a Nebula finalist. Um, and of course, since then, uh, RB has written a number of stories set in this world, uh, some of which BCS has published, uh, has written a number of other things. They're also a poet. Um, and they have a novella set in this bird verse world coming out from Tachyon, I believe, later this year. Uh, so to me, the the progression of that as a, as an author uh in my uh uh open submissions inbox who i had not read before um with a fantasy world that it was wonderfully realized and that was saying something that was very important to me um and that was moving me deeply um to see the those stories and that body of work set in that world and that author um uh, move through that progression which of course is still ongoing uh, uh, is something that, uh, in addition to the stories being absolutely wonderful and brilliant, I, I treasure that um, work, that relationship with the author, and that entire uh, progression. Thank you, Scott. Chinello. Yeah, I have to agree with Julia that this is like asking a mom to choose like which one of her kids is like the, her favorite. Um, it's really hard. I I will say that I'm very proud to have worked with Sui Davis Okumboa, who um, whose novel um, David Mogul God Hunter uh, came out I think last year, and um, just being able to see him move from you know just you know some of his first stories which were in some of the earliest um editions of Amenana to just the progression of of his talent and commitment to the craft has been amazing i know it's not something that i myself ever <laughs> put that much work into um i have to say though but every every time i think Every time an author sent something again after being rejected is, um, I, it, it kind of fills my heart with a little bit of joy because every time I tell an author, okay, this is close but not quite, or this isn't working, a part of me fears that that author will say, oh, well, I'm not good enough, I'll never write again, and then, you know, abandons it. There's so many horror stories of people who, who talk about that one editor who crushed their creative spirit and they couldn't write for four years after that. And you never want to, and you wonder, was I, was that me? Was that, did I do that? Um, and I've had, you know, I, I'm still haunted by stories that I really wanted to take. Um, it wasn't quite there. And I never heard from the author again. Um, and I wonder, did that person continue writing? Um, was it, did they stop? And if they did, was it my fault? And so when you see an author kind of 
take in what you've suggested and then come back to you in another, you know, submission cycle with something even better. You're like, yes. <laughs> and, and when you see that author's name popping up in other places, you're like, yes. It's like seeing your kid, you know, um, winning, you know, going out to the swim meet in other schools and you're like, you're not there, but you're cheering, you're cheering that person on. And I, I kind of wish more writers knew how much editors cared about their craft and their well-being as writers. Um, uh, I think too many writers still see editors as combatants, as people who are standing in the way of their of their greatness. When I think a good editor is actually more like a like a cheerleader. A good editor wants you to do your absolute best. A good editor wants to be absolutely invisible in your story. I, I don't want to see my hands work. You know, I want to make sure that you are shining. I want to be the 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 you know the reflective surface that shines the brilliance onto your work. I don't want to be seen. And so sometimes, especially when you are coming with when you're working with writers who may have come from systems that have spent too many times trying to grind them down into a particular voice or a particular style or a particular way of talking. And this is very common with um, marginalized voices. Um, a lot of the stories we get in Anathema are stories that were rejected elsewhere because the editors at those places were like, eh, we don't really understand what you're trying to do here. We don't really, we, why, do, why do they have to be queer? Why does this have to be, you know, why does it have to be two women? Can't one of them be a guy, you know? And, um, and so we spend a lot of time sort of building writers back up and saying, no, your voice matters. What you're trying to say matters and how you're trying to say it matters. Um, and we want to help you say it in the best way so that everybody can see how amazing we think you are. So um, a big part of, uh, so I can't say specifically one person, but we've published Wale Talabi, we've published Tari Thompson, we've published Chikodili and Melamadu. And all those people are right now, you know, they're winning awards, they're writing books, they're, they're doing amazing things in the field. And it makes me so incredibly proud to say, yeah, we, did, we helped with that. Like we had one of their stories. We had one of their early things. It was great. So um, yeah, uh, w one person, no, there isn't one person. There are lots of people that I'm incredibly proud to have been part of their, you know, their process. Wendy. Actually, my favorite stuff uh, that I've really worked on has got to be uh, stuff for uh, Nightmares, the H Word series. Uh, it's actually nonfiction where we ask writers of horror to like unpack things about the genre or to interrogate it or to explain why it matters and why it's important. And, you know, I've really discovered that a lot of people who write fiction are not very good about writing about themselves and their feelings. And this can actually like be kind of hard for them. Um, and it's just really great to see, you know, writers ranging widely from people who are really well established, like, you know, Brian Evanson, uh, to other people like who are maybe more in mid notes in the field, like um, Livia Llewellyn had this amazing essay and she was like so afraid of like saying stuff about work and saying stuff about her thoughts on fiction that she was like, oh, this is terrible. You're going to hate it. You should just erase it. And I was like, no, you're keep working on it, you know, and just, um, just seeing people like put themselves on their page instead of, you know, their characters and sort of like confronting their relationship with their work and with this amazing genre I get to work in, that is really fantastic. And I uh, feel really lucky to get to work with those people because, you know, sometimes they're really opening up in ways I never expected to. And I think it's, uh, it's hard to make yourself uh, feel exposed and vulnerable like that. So I'm thanks to each and every one of them. 
Thank you, Wendy. Rashida is joining us again. Thank you, Rashida. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This has been fascinating. And I feel like we had a whole list of questions that we wanted to ask our editors, but you have a list of questions that you're dying to ask. So we want to hurry up and get to them. We're going to go a little bit long tonight, um, longer than usual, but we do want to hit some of the questions that are coming into the queue. So please be patient. If you ask your question, we're going to do our best to get to it. If you have any other burning ones, plop them in there now and we'll try. We'll do our best, um, but we do have quite a few. So I'll just turn it right back over to Misha and I'll see you at the end. Thanks, Rashida. Our first question tonight comes from our own Nisi Shaw. I would like to know which dream project each editor holds in their heart. Uh, Wendy. Well, you know, I kind of feel like editing Nightmare Magazine is my dream project, and I'm really, really excited about jumping into it. Uh, you know, I'm going to open the submissions for my first, well, it's not my first ever open submissions call because I did you know, I, I was the editor in chief for Queers Destroy Horror, um, but it's in, in September. We're going to be bringing people in to to have fiction that is just for me. It's not for John and me. It's it's just for me. So that is basically my dream project right there, and I'm gonna live that dream. Thank you, Wendy Chinello. Um, for me, my dream project has been something that I, I started working on and then put on the back burner um, as other things kind of came my way. Um, I want to put together an anthology of um, African women's fiction, speculative uh, writing from African women. And um, a lot of the voices that I had, like I had a list of people, I contacted them, I got in touch with some edit, with some publishers and nothing's really come of it yet. And uh, I've had to sort of put it away a little bit, um, hopefully come back to it soon. Um, but uh, you know, the, 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 the crazy thing, it was, it was supposed to be a, an anthology of emerging writers. And then a bunch of those writers kind of just, you know, overshot and, are, and you know, um, are now, you know, recognizable. I like Neka uh, Arima was one of the emerging writers and now she's, amazing writer. So um, I still want to do this. Um, and hopefully some of the voices that I contacted um, will still have my time. <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, but that is my dream project. And um, I'm still, I still have hope that it will happen soon in the next couple of years. Like, like Julia, I'm very slow when it comes to my stuff. Um, creatively, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I know that when the spirit moves me again, I will be back on this. And hopefully, I don't know if there are any publishers out there who hear this and think this is a great idea. Scott. I would have to say that, that BCS really is my dream project. I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm living the dream. I had no idea that the readers would be interested in this kind of thing as much as I was, because uh, it, it seemed to me an, an unusual mix, you know, lush otherworldly fantasy, but with a literary focus on the characters. Um, and readers have read it and were largely supported by donations because we're nonprofit. They've donated um, ebook subscribers, the Patreon supporters. Um, so I feel completely grateful uh, for, for all of that, that, that readers have responded artistically and writers. Um, you know, 12 years online is, uh, seems a, a lifetime. So I'm, I'm grateful that it's gone that long, that, that people have trusted me, not only with stories that you know, are, are a fantasy world that they love and have developed, but stories that they feel are important for, for reasons uh, that extend into our world. Um, so that has meant a, a great deal to me that it's not just escapism, it's also moving people and it's also hopefully making comments uh, through the, the medium of fantasy, you know, the literalization of uh, metaphors and ideas that are impacting on our own world. Um, so, so I feel like I'm uh, living the dream and I, and I hope to keep uh, living that as long as possible. Julia. This is an ever changing dream for me because it's basically whatever I get excited on to work on next. And I have had the 
pleasure and privilege and honor of working on so many things that have been dream projects, like Kaleidoscope, the anthology that I mentioned before, which was diverse YA science fiction and fantasy. And that was a delight from start to finish. Honestly, right now, I'm in a little bit of a break. And I'm, I'm thinking that the next thing I want to do is something really lighthearted and fun. And I'm not exactly sure what that will be, but I'm kind of thinking about maybe just uh, doing a year of Mermaids Monthly. Just because I've been talking about Mermaids Monthly flippantly for years and years, but what if it actually existed? Wouldn't that be fun? I think it's going to happen. I do. Um, I have a, a, a couple of the same questions came in um, from people. Cosmata and Ramona have questions about what advice you give to new writers and, and about how to get ready for the submission process. Uh, Julia, do you want to tackle that first? Okay. Wow. Um, new writers. There are so many things that I could say, but uh, the first thing that I will say is that there is a giant community out there and trying to find a way into that writing community is the, the best thing that you can do. Finding ways to engage with people who are your peers and who are also a little bit ahead of you in the writing process, because there will be so many people who are willing to share information with you and help you. And also when you meet your peers, those people are coming up with you and they will be your support network and they'll be the people that read your stories and exchange them with you and trade information about the newest markets and all of those things. But if you're just looking for one resource, I'd say that a place to look if you don't know where to submit is the submissions grinder because it is free. It lists markets and you can kind of tweak it to uh, use the search engine by word length and genre and pay rate. And you can see what is out there, who is, who is accepting work right when you are ready to submit your story. Because if there's one thing that's more important than anything else, it's actually submitting your work because you won't get published if you don't. Wendy? Yeah, I got to say, like, don't self-reject, don't self-reject, don't self-reject. I mean, that is literally my job. Uh, so let me do my job. Just send me, send me your goodies and, and I'll think about them because who knows what amazing treasure you just sent me. Um, another thing is like, don't, don't feel weird or awkward if you haven't taken a bunch of writing classes, if you didn't get a chance to go to a big workshop, um, if you're out there looking for a little more support as you're getting into writing there and you're like, wow, there is no way I can take six weeks and go to Clarion, you know, like that might not be in the cards for you. Maybe you have a kid, maybe you have, you know, a budget that's not going to allow that. Maybe you, you just don't even want to, because the idea of living with other people for six weeks and like having to interact with them makes you want to rip your hair out. There are a ton of wonderful resources out there. Um, there's lots of books. It's almost too overwhelming with how many books there are, uh, but there are lots of small scale local events. I mean, and a lot of them are doing stuff online right now, which makes it even more convenient. I know Cascade Writers here in the Pacific Northwest is an invaluable resource. Their classes are extremely affordable. Um, they have weekend classes and they have like a three-day workshop. Um, you know, there are other choices besides Clarion that are maybe a little bit longer, but I mean, a little bit shorter than Clarion, uh, but still really rigorous. Like, um, at Kansas State, you know, Kids Johnson has this wonderful novel workshop that I know so many people who have gone and done it. It's like, I want to say two weeks long. And, you know, it, that's a lot, but like at the same time, it's not so much that it's, it's impossible. So just like do some research and, and see, like if, if you start feeling like you do need that support, it's, um, there are so many people out there like ready to help you. Oh, and I mean, Clarion West also has all these wonderful weekend workshops. Um, many are being offered online now, which so you can, even if you don't live in Seattle, you've got so many fantastic teachers lined up. So you, and those are really nice because they can focus on like particular specific things. Like maybe you are just like really 
anxious and feeling bad about how you're ever going to get through the middle of your book. Well, they probably have a workshop on that. Um, and I, I just feel like we're really lucky to be working in spec fic because I feel like there's an abundance of resources, many of which are reasonably priced and just a lot of people who are excited to like support you and help you. A lot of great organizations. Thank you. Chinello. Um, I would echo uh, what everything that's been said, uh, but I would also say um, start local. Um, one of the, when I got serious about my writing, one of the first things I did was um, start attending a, uh, um, I was living in Abuja at the time, I started attending um, a group of, you know, Abuja writers, and they got together, they, they'd read each other's work and offer helpful suggestions, tips, um, nobody else was kind of doing um, speculative fiction at the time, and I remember I'd get questions like, why do there have to be dragons in this? And, you know, but it was still very, um, it was still invaluable to me because what it did was it provided a sense of place uh, and a sense of community where all these other people were interested in the same things. Um, they were all readers, which is really important. Um, I don't know how, how much I can stress being in a space where no one thinks that you are odd simply for existing. And, um, and sometimes that space is online, but it's even more important when that space is not just online, but in your city, in your town, in your country, because then there are all these um, local nuances that you don't necessarily have to explain to each other. And sometimes I found being not from North America in more North American spaces, there are nuances, there are cultural competencies that I lack. And if I hadn't started out in a space that was more local, that sort of helped me build up my confidence to be able to exist in these other spaces that were more international, I'm not sure it would have worked in the same way. Um, but knowing that I had, you know, a few years under my belt of people in my own community who thought my writing was worth getting out there was really important. So sometimes I think, um, sometimes authors can jump in a little too deep, uh, right into the deep end of the pool and get really discouraged by the flood of rejections that might come their way. And so I would caution that it's like, it's like learning to swim, really. Um, you don't just like plunge yourself into the middle of an ocean with the tidal waves going. You start, you know, at the local pool, and then you move on, and then you, you have instructors. Um, and so I would, I would really encourage anyone who wants to sort of get into the writing game is to have uh, a community of peers. And that could be just people that you know personally or people who live in your town, your city, your country um, that can help you sort of gain your feet. And, you know, they'll always be the people that have your back. And that's one of the things I discovered. A lot, some of the people that I started writing with at the Abuja Writers um, Forum are still some of my biggest supporters. They still send me things. They're like, we've read your thing and that thingy thing, great job. And it fills my heart with joy uh, because these are my, this is my crew. You know, we all started out the same way and we we're all going in the same direction. So um, the magic of the internet is that a simple Google search can, can lead you to a whole lot of things. Facebook is an amazing, community marketplace where a lot of people are meeting each other um, in their local languages and, do, you know, in their own small um, corners of the world. And so I would encourage you to do, I would encourage all writers to do that. Thank you, Chanelo. Scott? I would say that I, I think two uh, uh, skills that uh, uh, new writers could uh, aim to gradually build up or to uh, uh, acquire. Uh, one would be is learning when to ignore people about your writing and when to listen to people about your writing. 
Um, cause, uh, uh, I sometimes see that at play in critique groups or workshops or when an editor comments, uh, on a, on a story, um, that, that maybe didn't work for them or even did work for them. Um, so I think part of growing, uh, and emerging as a new writer is gradually building your own sense of, um, evaluating that kind of feedback and opinions and deciding, what things and and when to listen to those and when to uh, kind of not and stick with your own vision. And and the second thing I think is good for all writers to try to to build to and aspire to is writing the stories that only you can write. Uh, everyone has unique experiences. Everyone has unique interests and hobbies. Everyone has a unique mindset. Uh, everyone, a different personality, write the stories that only you can write. And to me, that doesn't mean that you need some wildly, uh, brand new uh, original fantasy world that nobody's ever done before. It means that you need to give your own take on things and your own investment in the story and the world, and especially the characters uh, and the themes and, and what's going on uh, in those stories. And I think the R.B. Lemberg stories would be a great example of that. Those are stories that only R.B. Lemberg could write. Those stories are of their sensibilities um, and their experiences as a person uh, and as a creator of a fantasy world and uh, character and thematic things. Um, so uh, that to me is a, is a progression for uh, writers to work toward. As far as submissions, I would say uh, be professional about it. You know, read the magazine guidelines, um, uh, learn a little bit about standard manuscript format, uh, just approach it in, in a uh, reasonably professional way because um, uh, uh, that sort of uh, seriousness or attention to detail or craft uh, will come through. Thank you, Scott. So we're in the the kind of uh, thick of it. We've got lots of questions. I won't be able to get to them all. I'm so sorry. And I'm so appreciative of everyone who submitted questions. Um, but in the interest of time, I may not call on all of you. If you're burning to answer a question, just, you know, gesture or, you know, un unmute yourself. Um, so I'm going to conflate a couple of questions here we got in. Uh, Agner asks, what are a couple of things that you see hold good writers back from getting accepted at MAGS? And then... Um, uh, Tom asked, tell us what kinds of stories you'd like to see that you're not seeing. Who would like to jump? I would I would say the write only stories you can write. I get a lot of stories that feel to me similar or ordinary. They're good, but they're not great. Um, sometimes the prose is sort of similar approaches or, or prose texts or language syntaxes that I see a lot of writers doing. Um, sometimes it doesn't have deep emotional investment. It's just a story. Um, it's not moving me. Um, so I would say try to put your own uh, uh, spin on things and, and write not only the story only you could write, write it in the way that only you could write. And that might be a time to not listen to other people so much um, and do it your way uh, in your own way. That, that's what a thing that I see sometimes holding submissions and writers back. Anyone else want to jump in with thoughts? Chinello? Yeah, for me, uh, a, big, a big thing I see that um, uh, particularly when you read the submission guidelines carefully that that's a big thing um i've seen i've had really good stories sent to to us but they were just the wrong market because the person didn't necessarily take the time to read other stories in that magazine and so it's a perfect story for Umenana, but not for anathema um or it's the perfect story for um you know BCS, but not for anathema. Um, that's how you get a lot of white people sending stories in to a magazine that is specifically for queer people of color. People are not reading. And, and I don't care how good your story is, it's just not going to get in. Um, but I will say, though, that um, one thing I will, I will ask writers to do is take chances. Um, and I, I, I sometimes see a, a, a story that's just this close, but the writer was afraid to take it that next step. 
um, I had one of my favorite stories um, was basically the origin story of a supervillain. But at the very end, the writer was like, no, 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 no. This person can't do this horrible thing. I'm going to walk it back. So what I, what we did was, I was like, they're ready to do this thing. Let them do the thing. Uh, because you could almost see the writer kind of reach into the story and pull the character back um, and say, no, 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 you can't do this. Um, so I, I would always encourage writers to just, you know, go for it. Your, your, your character is about to eat the other character, let them eat the other character and face consequences. You know, let's not have some, you know, deus ex machina, like come in and you, you cannot eat that character, eat the character and see what happens. So um, I always encourage that, you know, uh, sometimes you see people have an idea, but they're not quite sure where to take it. So they take it down the route that everyone else has taken it, you know, um, and you see some, that's why you see some of the same tropes show up over and over and over again, you know. Um, and, I, and I would encourage you, I would encourage writers to say, you know, I've seen this happen before. What if this happened? What if this thing that everybody else is writing, what if I did it this other way? And oftentimes it's already there in the story. It's just that the writer, you know, at the last minute maybe asked themselves, well, what if people don't like this? Or, uh, I don't know, people might not, mm, let me not. Throw that voice out of the window. As, as a writer myself, what I'm learning to do is just push it all the way to the maximum. You know, um, make, make your characters uh, minotaurs if that's the way you thought they were going to be. Just, just do the thing, do the thing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more audience question, then a couple of speed round last questions. I did want to ask if you'd be willing to potentially answer some of the questions that we didn't get to in a, a Twitter thread afterwards. Awesome. So everybody keep an eye out for that on the Clarion West Twitter feed. Um, so uh, Nikita asks, what advice would you have for international writers who want to get published in your magazines? I'm Guyanese and pretty new to the industry, and I'm trying to feel my way into publishing. Who would like to jump in there? So um, my advice um, is to, well, I've already given it, but seriously, read the submission guidelines. I cannot emphasize to you enough how often that, you know, um, writers, especially if there might be a bit of a language barrier or a cultural barrier, um, make sure that you are submitting in the guideline style that's been asked for. Uh, make sure that you, uh, you're you getting everyone's name spelled correctly. Um, there are a ton of examples for query letters online. Read those and, and try as much as you can to, to fit into those. So sometimes what I get is, I know that in different markets, um, different uh, cultural uh, requirements are, are asked for. So. For instance, if you're sending something in Nigeria, people want you to give a bit of a, a short synopsis of the story in your submission. When you're sending to the North American market, that is not what's asked for. So what you want to do is make sure that you are adhering to the unspoken cultural requirements of any magazine or any international publication that you're sending out to. And so that does mean you have to do your research. The great thing is that we all, well, not all of us, but many of us have the internet these days. And so there's, there are a lot more resources online than there used to be. Um, when I was submitting, I had to go through, and I think there was like a, like a single magazine that you had to, or single directory that you had to go and, and look up what, you know, publications were accepting. Now I don't, I, I don't need to do that. There are at least five, six blogs that tell me, you know, who's looking for what. Um, so do your research beforehand. And, um, and of course, if you, need, if you need any help or if you have any questions, um, there are a lot of forums right now, especially on Facebook, where people who have already sent things to international you know, uh, publications are will be willing to uh, ask, respond to you. So um, another thing you can do is 
if you see a name that you recognize published in, let's say, um, you know, SNF, science fiction and fantasy, contact that person, ask them how they did it, ask them what, what um, requirements are, 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 uh, are needed to get into that particular publication. Most writers are chatty. We are more than happy to answer questions if we have time. We're more than happy to, you know, shoot you back a two or three line email. Um, so don't be afraid to, you know, reach out, ask people questions, send people emails. The worst they can do is not respond. So, yeah. Any other thoughts on that question, Julia? Yes. So I will say that whenever I have done my own editing and chosen how the submissions forms will look or what the guidelines will look like, I try to make it as open as possible. And I'll try to give clear examples of things that I would like to see in a cover letter, for instance, if I'm asking for a cover letter. But I would always rather have there be a smaller barrier to entry. So I don't want someone to feel like I did a cover letter wrong, so I'm going to be rejected because that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a story that's going to move me in whatever way. I think it's always fine if you don't know, if you've read the guidelines and you have a question about something and you haven't got the idea of how to figure it out, to query the editor and just send a query. There usually should be some instructions on how to submit a query saying, you know, oh, I, I want to submit this story, but I don't know if it quite fits your guidelines. Any editor that is a reasonable human will not be offended by this at all and will answer your question so that you can submit it in the right way. If an editor gets very upset with you for asking a query like that, maybe you don't want to work with that editor. So that's a thing that I would say, yes, everything Chanelo said, but also don't be so afraid of us that you can't ask us questions if you're confused because we are here to help. We want everybody to have the best experience that they can. Scott. Uh, I've also seen that sort of question asked by writers on places like Twitter. So if that's a comfortable place for you to ask that, I think that's an option too. Thank you. Okay, we have a speed round. Three quick questions, quick answers. The book you think everyone needs to read right now. Scott? Uh, I will mention R.B. Lemberg's forthcoming novella again, which is called The Four Profound Weaves. It is an actual paper book, so hopefully it counts for this question. I think it's out in September from Tachyon, and it flat out made me cry. So that's the best endorsement I can give. I'm going to assume that was me. Um, I, uh, Sui Davis's, I think I mentioned it, um, Sui Davis's uh, David Mogul, God Hunter. Um, I, I think it's an amazing book. Uh, sadly, it is the last book I read, which was last year. <laughs> uh, and so it's the freshest in my mind. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if, if anyone is reading anything uh, this year, I, that is the book I would recommend you read. Uh, Sui Davis Okumbo. Thank you. Wendy. I too am a little behind on my reading. Uh, the, actually the second book in the series is like coming out right now, but if you have not read the exquisitely violent and exciting fantasy novel, A Rage of Dragons by Evan Winters, it is an absolute delight. I read it in one day and it was like 500 pages long. Julia. All right, first I want to second Scott's recommendation for R.B. Lemberg's novella, which I gave a blurb to, and I loved it so much. So definitely look forward to that one. The book that I'm going to suggest is actually a few years old. It's by Carlos Hernandez. It's called The Assimilated Cuban's Guide to Quantum Santeria. And if you want to talk about a book that could only be written by the author that wrote it, that is definitely a unique voice and simultaneously 
gut-wrenchingly emotionally moving in places and also laugh out loud funny in other places and very irreverent. I mean, there's a whole story about panda sex and it's just kind of like, what, (laughs) what is happening here? But then there are other stories that deal with deep emotional questions of grief and heartbreak and understanding. And it all goes through this lens of the, the experience of being someone like me who has Latinx roots, but also is thoroughly assimilated into American culture. And how does that affect who you are? Wow. Uh, okay. Um, those are also great. The trope you want to kill right now. Julia? I don't know. I feel like everybody always has the sort of like, oh, here's a list of things I don't want. And honestly, I don't know. I think any trope can be amazing if you do it well. So I don't think any tropes necessarily need to die. I think that it's just a question of whether or not you've managed to capture my fancy at the moment. Wendy? I mean, maybe uh, motivating characters by killing their girlfriends. That's about all I can think of. Scott. The trope I see too much is stories that open in a fantasy tavern. Stock, prancing pony, brie, you know, there's often the hooded person in the corner, mysterious. Yes. So I agree with Julia. Anything can work if it's done well, but it needs to be done really well. And I see that very, very often. Janelle. Um, Abuse is love. Uh, I think that, especially in queer communities, there is a, we, not just queer, but marginalized communities, many of us have had histories of colonial violence, of, um, of historical violence done in the name of sort of our benefit. And so sometimes what happens is that within those things become sort of passed down through DNA in in ways that are very, that can be very destructive. And so one, one, my current, you know, example of that is, you know, the queer character falling in love with the abuse person who was very abusive towards them who turned out to also be queer and was only being abusive because they were in love with uh, I w- many marginalized communities especially queer communities especially in a country like Nigeria where homophobia is so deeply entrenched um, we are forced to love in secret we are forced to love with the threat of violence hanging over our heads, sometimes even from the people that we love. And one of the things that I would love to see die a beautiful death in many flames is making that somehow attractive and somehow aspirational through our literature. Because a lot of queer, young, brown and black people are reading our stories and are seeing themselves reflected in their pages. They're seeing these stories as blueprints for what their lives could look like or where their uh, imaginations could run to. And so I think it's important that we be responsible with that power as writers. And so when, you know, Admittedly, I do want to see as many stories as possible. I, I love a trope that is undermined in a beautiful way. But I think that in order to do that, you have to be very conscious about what it is you're writing in the first place. In order to make a trope not be a trope, you need to know that it is a trope to begin with. And you need to know that it, is, it could be harmful to you know to some of your readers so if you're going to engage in it do so consciously do so with skill uh, and do so with humanity and empathy and i think too many times when you have um let's say white writers who decide to write queer characters into their stories or white writers or straight writers who decide to write queer characters or white writers who decide to write black writers 
characters into their stories, they don't understand the nuances and the subtleties. And they think, if I just do it, it will work out. And I think that there needs to be more, how would I put it? There just needs to be a little bit more care put into some of these stories than is often seen. And that's all I ask. Thank you all. One last question to close us out, lightning round. Can science fiction and fantasy still give us hope? Scott, you're nodding. Go. Uh, yes, I think so. I, I, absolutely. It needs to be well written. There's a lot of things, at least to my eye, that make me feel unhopeful going on in the world today. So it may be a higher bar, but yes, absolutely. I think any story about the human heart in conflict with itself can make, has a chance to make me feel hope. Julia. Yes, a hundred percent. And I want to be clear that sometimes hope comes from stories that are unflinching in their examinations of darkness and anger and oppression that when someone who is feeling the weight of all of that explores it through their fiction, sometimes that can create something very hopeful. And so I would say that yes, and sometimes dark fiction is also hopeful fiction. And it's important to remember that. And it's also true that sometimes we can have happy fiction that is hopeful. There's room for all kinds, but it's important. Your voice is important. And what you choose to stay with it is very important. And I'm always excited to listen. Janelle. I think that science fiction is inherently hopeful. Um, any, the, the, the point of fiction, uh, science fiction is to ask what if. And, and by doing so, you already step into a place uh, out, out of, even the most dystopian fiction has in it a core of hopefulness because it says to us, there but for the grace of God, or there but if we are not careful. Um, I do find that a lot of times the stories that are being written by, you know, um, some of the newer voices that have not had the space to tell their stories these days um, does have in it this kernel of optimism that I don't often see in some of the more established voices and established um, spaces. Um, I think in, in a lot of ways, the West is very much concerned with its own downfall in a way that, that, um, that some of the dominant voices can seem a bit limiting. So there's a lot of sky is falling, sky is falling. Oh God, oh God, oh God. And you know what? Things are not looking great. But um, when I look at some of the fiction that's coming out of, you know, um, India and, and, and Nigeria and Singapore, they are oddly hopeful, oddly sweet, oddly light. And, and, and I think that's in response to the fact that when you are already living in dystopia, the act of writing a utopia is, is itself revolutionary. So I think sometimes the preoccupation with the West is going to look like the third world um, kind of can take over. But when you're already living in the third world, well, where do you go from there? And so, yeah, um, speculative fiction is inherently hopeful simply by being speculative because it asks us to imagine more than what we see in front of us. Thank you. Wendy? I don't think I need to add anything. I think everybody said, did a great job. Well, thank you all so much. Um, we again wish we'd had even more time. Rashida is going to send us off into the sunset, but thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, editors, for sharing all of your insights tonight. 
All right. So just a reminder, uh, again, like Misha said, thank you all so much. Uh, this is an incredible panel. We could have obviously gone on for another two hours plus, um, but I don't think any of us have that much screen time stamina anymore. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. This is the fifth week of the Summer write -thon. It's our biggest fundraiser, and this year it's our biggest community event of the year. Uh, it's not too late to sponsor a writer who's participating in the write -thon. So we can't thank you enough for helping to ensure that we can continue to offer free and low-cost writing pro programs and classes online, as well as more classes and workshops that are fully ADA accessible when we're able to meet in person uh, with your donations. So if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, you won't want to miss Monday the 27th. So it's next Monday, not a Tuesday. It's going to be at 6 p.m., same time, different night. Uh, we'll be having an open mic and night in collaboration with two-hour transport. Joining us for the first part of the evening will be writers and participants from this year's Write-A-Thon. And then we'll finish up the, the event with some of our Clarion West alum. We're very excited to be welcoming them back uh, and having this open mic night. This will be our last live event of the summer season. So we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you and good night.